I was asked to uh, present our next speaker, uh, Michael Kirisk, uh, who is one of the, uh, the maintainer of the, the Man Pages project. He has a very interesting book about Linux programming interfaces. Uh, this is, so there are two books about uh, Linux programming. One of them is the kernel programming book, which gets obsolete every six months. This is not that one. Uh, and he's going to talk about something very interesting. Uh, I have this case. Uh, there was a, I was sitting with a friend who's a network administrator, and somebody asks us, uh, we need, I have this and this problem, how do you, are you going to fix this? And uh, I'm a system administrator, and so the, the guy says, use tspdump, I said use strace. So basically this is the difference between system and network administrators. Uh, uh, network administrators, administrators use tspdump, we use strace. And this is probably one of the best tools I've ever seen to debug anything. And I've done this with uh, browsers running JavaScript, so uh, I hope you'll have a lot of fun listening to this talk. Thank you. Good afternoon. Am I too loud? No? Okay. Good. Then, let's get going. Um, my intention here really is just to provide an introduction to S-Trace. If you've spent a bit of time using S-Trace already, maybe you will only learn a few new things. So it's really, I'm taking it from the beginning when it comes to talking about S-Trace. Um, um, just a little bit about myself. I'm the maintainer of the Linux Man Pages project. That takes care of the documentation of system calls provided by the Linux kernel. Uh, also um, libc functions, mainly from glibc. And I've been doing that for about 10 years now. Um, so that's my main way of being involved with Linux. So I do a lot of testing, some design review, uh, and documentation. Um, otherwise, I'm a trainer, writer, programmer. So that's my question, actually. What do people here do? Who, who's, a, who, who's a systems administrator? Okay. Who's, who's a programmer? Who's something else? Okay. <laughs> Can I see the programmers again? Who's a C programmer or a C++ programmer? Okay. Who's a Java programmer? Okay. Okay, so maybe then it helps just to give a little bit of a background for people who aren't necessarily C programmers or aren't programmers at all um, about what S-Trace is doing for us. Um, and what it's letting us do is watch the system calls that a process makes. And then you say, well, what is a, systems, what is a system call? And then there's various possible answers to that question. One is, it's a request to the kernel to do something on behalf of a program. Things like opening a file, or starting a new program, or creating a new process. There's various kinds of requests that you can make to the kernel to do something on your behalf as a program. Or, if you looked at it from a programmer's point of view, you might just say, this just looks like any other function call that I usually use in my program. So we might see a bit of code like this where you open a file, uh, and you say, how do you want to open it? And you give some arguments to the, to the system call to describe what it should do. If you looked at it from an S-trace point of view, I think especially, then what a system call is, is a controlled entry point into the kernel. Um, it's a way of getting the kernel to execute a certain piece of code um, that does something for you. And the key point about this is that the kernel is composed of millions of lines of code, thousands of functions, but user space programs can't call those functions directly. That that code is behind a wall that means that programs aren't able to treat it as though there were functions that could be called from a library. Instead, what you do is you make system calls. And a system call is just a certain entry path into the kernel's code to do some operation that you want to do. It's, it's the principal way of getting kernel code executed on your behalf. There are some others as well, things like the slash proc file system or the slash sys file system, 
which especially as a systems administrator you might be familiar with also. There's some things about system calls, um, it, it, some general things you can make uh, as observations. One is the set of system calls that are that are available on a particular system, it depends on your operating system. So Linux has a certain set of system calls, um, Mac OS X has another set of system calls, Windows has another set of system calls, and each one of those set of system calls is completely different. And that's the fundamental reason why you can't run a Windows program on Linux, or a Linux program on Mac OS X, and, and so on. Um, so on Linux there's about 400 system calls, um, you can see them all, they're all listed in one page called syscalls, um, and so you can see what's available. Just digging a little bit deeper, what happens when we make a system call, um, there's, there's a number of steps that happen. First of all, the first thing you usually do is you don't call a system call directly. What you usually do is call a wrapper function inside a C library. That's why system calls look like normal functions, even though underneath they're not. That wrapper function does a whole lot of things. One is it takes the arguments that were passed um, in the function call and puts them into registers. And that's because the kernel expects the arguments to be in certain registers. Another thing that the wrapper function does is put the system call number into another register. And the reason here, again, is, well, we're not calling functions in the kernel. The, there's no way of actually specifying an address of a function you want to call in the kernel. To say which system call you want to make, you specify a system call number. Okay, it'll be some small number, but each system call has a different number. And then the wrapper function will execute a, a machine language instruction that flips the CPU into kernel mode. And the key point about being in kernel mode is you can touch pieces of memory that aren't available when the CPU is operating in so-called user mode. So now you can, the, the CPU can execute kernel code. It can modify memory locations in kernel space. Um, once the kernel's got control, it executes something called the system call handler. And the system call handler will then call something called what's, what's usually called the system call service routine. This is a piece of code in the kernel, or this, I'll rephrase that. For each different system call number, there's a different syscall handler, a different service routine. And that'll do whatever the system call is supposed to do. This is the real work, if you like. And then eventually the system call handler will finish doing what it does. Um, It'll probably put some return value into a register to indicate whether the system call succeeded or failed. And then it'll execute a machine language instruction that'll flip us back into user mode. Now the CPU can't touch kernel mode memory anymore. Now I've highlighted two pieces there in red, and the, that transition from user mode into kernel mode, and from kernel mode back to user mode, the, these are significant because these are the two points where S trace gets control of the process, just, just as we're about to make the system call and just after it's completed. The wrapper function will do a bit of tidying up at the end, it'll look at the return value that came back from the system call. If there was an error that came back from the system call, the error number gets put into a magic global variable called Erno, uh, and programmers can inspect that variable to see why did a system call fail. Okay, so that's just a bit of preamble. Now to look at S-Trace. Um, the, the whole idea of S-Trace is it's a, um, a tool that lets you monitor the set of system calls that an application makes. Underneath it's implemented using a system call called P-Trace, so the, there's a special system call that lets you do system call tracing. Um, this is the same system call that's used by GDB, the debugger. Um, and by one or two other tools as well. Another way of thinking about S-Trace, um, it's a debugging tool where you're monitoring the complete conversation that happens between a, a user space program and the kernel. And in order to monitor that conversation, you don't need to see the entire source code of the, or, sorry, I'll rephrase that. You don't need the source code of the application. 
Whereas if you're using the debugger, for instance, GDB, to get the best results from GDB, you want to have the source code as well. Let's do things like answering, you know, which files is this process opening? Um, I've lost my thread slightly, excuse me. Um, what arguments being passed to each system call? What system calls are being made? Which system calls are failing and why are they failing? So when you run, a, when you run um, S trace, you get back a lot of information about the system calls your application is making. That inf the, the beauty of S trace is all that information comes back in symbolic form. What I mean by that is you things, see things like the name of the system call, not the system call number. You see each of the arguments of the system call represented symbolically. So for instance, if a particular argument is a structure, you see the entire structure with the value of each field labeled with the field name. And if you've got bit mask arguments, instead of just seeing numeric values for those bit mask arguments, you'll see all of the various symbolic constants that are normally used with that um, function, with that system call, instead of just numbers. To put things another way, what this means is that S-Trace has intelligence about every system call that is made. It, you know, every time a new system call is added to the kernel, um, there have to be mod modifications made to S-Trace so that it learns to understand each system call and the arguments that it takes. Um, so here's an example then of some output from S-Trace. What we're seeing there, um, this is a call to a system call called FSTAT. Whoops, my laser printer doesn't work so well there. Um, but we see here, first of all, an argument three. This happens to be a file descriptor number. The second argument's interesting, though. What we see here is, whoops, is a structure. And that structure, we're shown that it's a structure by seeing braces at the beginning and the end. And for each field, we see a field label. So we see here, um, the, whoops, excuse me. We see the, the, a field label. Um, and then beside that field label, we'll see the field's value. And all of this information is displayed to us symbolically. Okay, so this thing here happens to be a device number, and device numbers are composed in um, the C library using a certain macro called makedev, which puts together the device's major number and minor number. So this is major number, make device with major number eight, minor number two. And we say the same sort of thing for all the other arguments of the system call, uh, sorry, all the other the fields in the structure, each broken down one by one. And so if we go along here further, for example, whoops. Here we see an argument that is um, a bit mask, uh, sorry, a field that is a bit mask, and we see um, some of the components of the mask shown symbolically. So there, instead of seeing the numeric value for S if reg, we see the name. Down here a little bit further, we've got a field that is a timestamp. Instead of seeing just a binary value for the timestamp, we see the timestamp displayed with, um, as a date plus time. For every system call, what we also see is the value that was returned by the system call. So this system call returns zero, which in this context means success. And we see the same sort of thing for every system call. So for the next system call here as well, whoops, excuse me. We also see uh, a return value of three from the open system call. Okay, so let's look at a very simple C program. All the C program does is write out a string and then terminate by calling exit. If we want to trace this with strace, what strace does by default is send all its output to standard error, which is likely to be the terminal. Probably we want to send the output to a file, though, so we can look at it later. The, well, one, re one, one reason, so we can look at it later. The other is that the output of strace is usually very extensive. For any interesting program, there's likely to be thousands of lines of output. So if we want to send the output to a file, we can use the dash O option. 
name a log file, and then off we go. Who uses Ubuntu? Anyone? If you use modern Ubuntu, you're going to need to do something like this because they've installed a security module which by default disables um, the ptrace system call. And there's a, there's a good reason for doing this, actually. The point being that if you can ptrace a process, I'll rephrase that. If you can compromise someone's program and trick that program into ptracing some other process owned by that user, then you can escalate an attack on a system. You might compromise as an attacker some very simple program, but perhaps you can compromise that program and then get it to ptrace the GPG agent and perhaps try and discover passwords. So this is the reason why Ubuntu and some other distributions um, by default disable ptrace and therefore um, disable strace um, and you have to set this, set this slash proc file in order to um, enable the use of strace. Okay. Um, when we trace this simple program, which had two system calls in it, um, I've, I've abbreviated the output here. The output was actually about 25 lines long, okay, even for that simple program. And most of the output that is up here had nothing to do with our program. It was actually stuff that was generated or executed by perhaps C runtime startup code or the dynamic linker which was loading in the libraries that we um, are going to use in this program. It's only the last two lines here that related to the system calls that our program made. So that's one thing you need to be aware of using S-Trace, some of the system calls you see displayed had nothing to do with what you did. They were done by code that got control before the main program started, um, or perhaps by some other libraries. So um, I've covered most of this already, but the point is that for each one of these system calls, we see the name of the system call, its arguments, we see its return value. Where a system call fails, so here, for example, that access system call failed. We can tell that because the return value that's shown there is minus one. And then strace recognizes that as a failure, and it shows us the reason for the failure. The reason for the failure is kept in a global variable, erno. We see the symbolic value of the error number. It's e no int, which is uh, for memory error number two. And we see the textual description of that error, um, which is file not found, or uh, sorry, no such file or directory. And sometimes when you're trying to work out what S-Trace is doing or what it's showing to you, you need to do a bit of detective work. So the very last call in our program was exit to terminate the program. And if you're a person that's savvy about the, li the C library and system calls, you know that exit the library function actually calls a system call called underscore exit. But we looked at what S-Trace showed us, and it showed exit underscore group. And the question is, where did that come from? So then you do a bit of detective work, and you go and look at the exit to man page, and in the last year or two, I've been increasingly adding annotations like this to the man pages, which tell you about the difference between the C wrapper function and what the system call is that is really underneath. So you go and look at the underscore exit man page, and it tells you that since GWC 2.3, which is quite a long time ago now, um, underscore exit is no longer a system call. It's actually a wrapper function that calls a system call called exit group. Okay, so you sometimes have to dig deep into the man pages, and you need to get recent man pages. Who uses die.net for their man pages? Don't do it. <laughs> They are horribly out of date. Years. Go to man7.org. <laughs> um, 
So you dig deep in the man pages and you can find the details that you need to try and understand the output from S-Trace. So then you can start doing some fancier things with S-Trace. For instance, by default, S-Trace, when you trace a program, if that program creates child processes, S-Trace doesn't show you what the child processes do. It only shows you what the process that executes your program is doing. But what you can do in, when you're running S-Trace is specify, specify an option dash F that says, trace not just this program that I'm starting now, but all of the children that it creates. Then when you look at your S-Trace output, you need to be able to distinguish what's being done by the different processes, because now potentially you're seeing output from several different processes. What S-Trace will do is at the beginning of each line, it'll show the PID of each process and the corresponding system call that it's making. So, um, sorry, I might lose a few non-C programmers at this point, but let, let's see if we can carry on anyway. Um, what this program here does, and mainly what I'm going to use it to do, is I'm going to, so I've got a program here that first of all prints out its PID, and then it creates a child process using fork, and then the child might, depending on what the command line arguments were, might end up executing another program. The way I'm going to use it, I'm not going to execute another program, I'm just going to create a child process. This is what the child does here. Meanwhile, the parent comes down here and waits for the child to terminate. And then, if I run this program, um, as I've done here, with um, no arguments, then all it's going to do is create a child process and then wait for that child process to terminate. So, the program helpfully prints out the PID of the child and the PID of the parent. And we can see that those numbers match up with these numbers over here. These are the PIDs of the parent and the child. The, child, the parent was PID 1939, the child was PID 1940. So then we can tell which system calls each process is making. We see some interesting things. My program called fork, there's no call to fork in this program, there's a call to something called clone. Okay, clone is the underlying function that is used to create child processes now by glibc. Okay, this is another change that happened in around about glibc 2.3. The, the, the kernel does have a fork system call, but nowadays it's not used. Instead, glibc directly calls the clone system call to do the same thing. Another thing, I said the program called wait, whoops, yet what we see here is a call to wait for, and again if you go to the wait man page, you'll see one of these C library kernel differences sections that says actually wait is a library function implemented using the wait for system call. The fork man page just by the way has the same information out, it says fork nowadays is a wrapper function that calls clone. There's some other interesting things that we see. Here's our call to wait, which is waiting for the child to complete. Now, the way that wait works is if the child hasn't terminated yet, wait blocks. In other words, the parent in this case is forced to wait for a while until the child calls exit. S-Trace recognizes that. If you remember, I said that S-Trace gets control at two points. One is on the entry point of the system call, and the other is on the return from the system call. Well, here's where the rest trace has got control on the entry to the wait system call, the wait for system call, and it recognizes the system call is blocking, that the parent is blocked, and it displays they're unfinished. Okay? The system call's blocked. Sometime later, it's going to unblock. And then later on, we see down here, first of all, that the child with PID 1940 terminates, and then further down, we see that wait for and the parent resumed. Okay, this is S-Trace capturing things once more on the completion of the wait call. Okay, and then 
One other piece to add to the puzzle there, um, when a child process terminates, the parent gets sent a signal, okay? And S-Trace captures signals as well, so it can see um, what signals are sent to the various processes that it's, tra that it's tracing. So I said that if you use S-Trace to look at any interesting program, you're going to get a lot of output. And usually most of the output is not interesting to you. So S-Trace has a lot of options that allow you to filter what output is going to be displayed to you. Um, one feature that you're probably going to commonly want to use with S-Trace is dash E, which, says, which allows you to select which system calls you want to see monitored. So you can think, say things like, whoops, um, S-Trace dash E trace equals, and then a list of system call names. And then S-Trace will only display information to you about those system calls. So here, for example, I've said just trace the open and close system calls that this process makes. Again, to get this job right, sometimes you need to dig dig into the man pages to find out what the real system calls are. For instance, if I tried to do an S trace where I said S trace dash E trace equals fork, even if I run that with a program that creates child processes, I'm not going to see anything. Because what I actually need to trace is the clone system call. There's a sort of converse operation where you can say S trace dash E trace equals shriek and then a system call, okay? I don't know what you call, what you prefer to call that character, I like to call it shriek, the exclamation mark. The idea here is that S-Trace will trace all system calls except this system call. And you might say, well, why would you want to do something like that? There are weird applications out there that do things like calling get time of day thousands of times a second, and you don't want to see all of that. It's not very interesting. Get time of day of just by the by is a system call that just returns the current time to you. So if you find you've got an application that's doing that sort of thing, you can filter out all of those system calls and get down to the list of system calls that's really interesting to you. This, this trace equals option also has some um, other features that you might find useful from time to time. There's the notion of system call categories. So you can say trace equals um, file, for instance. Show me all the system calls that this process makes that relate to files. Or um, trace equals desk. Show me all the operations, all the system calls this process makes that work with file descriptors. Or network operations. Or process creation operations. Um, there's about eight or ten different categories. I've just got a sampling of them there. You can also use the trace option, or sorry, the dash E option to filter the signals that you monitor. So you can say dash E signal equals and the name of some signal or several signals, and that'll let you choose um, which signals S trace is going to trace for you. Again, this is a negation syntax, where you can say, trace all signals except some signals. You can use the shriek character again. One of the quite nice options of S-Trace is the dash capital P option. This allows you to trace options, or tr trace actions on particular files, particular path names. Um, what S-Trace will do is, is show you the operations that happen on that path name. If you want to trace multiple files, you can use multiple dash P options. And he here's an example where I've said um, trace, whoops, sorry, uh, this is what I want here. Trace op operations on the file uh, libc64, libc.so.6. What is that, by the way? It's the C library. Um, and so what S-Trace will do, first of all, it does an interesting thing. It says, actually, that file name was a symbolic link, and it resolved to a different path name, and that's the real file. 
And then when we look at the trace output that we um, sent to a file here, we see at a certain point it opened, whoops, it opened this file and then it returned file descriptor number three. This is the file descriptor that's being used to access this file in this process. And S-Trace gets clever at this point. It said the user wants to see operations on this file. Okay? And now I've opened that file with file descriptor number three. That means the user is interested in seeing all the operations on file descriptor number three as well. So now I see down here a read on file descriptor number three. There's some reading occur for that file. I see an fstat operation on file descriptor number three. I see an mmap operation on file descriptor number three as well. So S-Trace has this intelligence about, you know, what is a file descriptor, which system calls are using that file descriptor, and it is able to put these pieces together for us to tell us a story about what's happened to that file. Okay, eventually, we close the file. And at that point, S-Trace realizes this file descriptor is being thrown away. It doesn't refer to that file anymore. And even if that file descriptor gets reused for a different file, it won't tell us about the operations. I'll just mention in passing, there's a bunch of other operations to do with S-Trace. Um, one thing you can do is S-Trace-C. This gives you a summary about the system calls that your application makes. So you see things like um, the number of system calls of each type, which is this column here, the number of those system calls that failed, and of course, the names of the system calls over here. What S-Trace also does is try and give you time estimates that are being, the, the estimates of the time spent make, making each one of these system calls. So you see, for instance, here, um, apparently nine microseconds per call to alarm. There were 72 calls there, and I think if you multiply 72 by nine microseconds, then you get something like, um, this number of my, uh, this fraction of seconds just here. Having said that, I, I tend not to trust the timing information that comes back from S Trace, and that's because S Trace itself quite impacts on the time that a process takes to execute or that a program takes to execute. But it gives us a relative idea of the cost of each system call. One of the other things you can do. Um, with S-Trace, all the examples I've looked at so far, you're just tracing a program that you start from the command line. With S-Trace, you can also trace a process that is already running. You say S-Trace-lowercase p, give it a PID, and it'll immediately start tracing that process, subject to permissions. Okay? You can't just go around tracing anyone's process. Essentially, it's the processes that you own. If you want to, you perhaps got a, a group of um, interrelated processes that are perhaps communicating, you can trace multiple PIDs by specifying dash P multiple times, each time with a different PID. This is not something you want to do in a production environment necessarily, because if you start tracing the system calls that you, or your process makes, you're probably going to slow down those system calls by a factor, well, at least an order of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude. So if you've got a, a process that's making lots of system calls, you can slow it down massively by using S-Trace. Um, when you finish tracing the process, though, just type Control-C to kill S-Trace, and the process is no longer being traced. Um, there's an option there. If you use dash P with dash F, that'll trace all the threads in a multi-threaded process. There's a bunch of other options as well. I'll just mention a few that might be interesting. By default, S-Trace, because the output can be so long, when S-Trace displays the output of each system call, it will abbreviate it for long system calls. So 
Um, if there's a big structure, for instance, you'll only see the first few fields of the structure. If there are a large environment passed on an exec system call, you won't see all of the environments being passed. If you use dash V for verbose, it'll show you everything, and your output will be much longer again. Um, similar sort of thing with strings, by default, S trace will um, truncate strings to 32 characters. Um, you can say to strace, show me the whole string using the dash s option. And you specify your, your um, truncation limit. strace is intelligent about strings, though. Path names it knows are special strings. Regardless of this option, it always shows you path names in full. There's a bunch of options to do with um, time and timing. I'll leave you to read the man page about that, about those ones. Um, one other option that sometimes is interesting is dash i. This says, when you trace a system call, show me also the value of the program counter. So you get some idea of where in your program the system call is being made. I'm going to give you back 10 minutes. <laughs> And this is some questions. <laughs> questions? I think the idea is to go to a microphone, yes. Take the long way. <laughs> so are there any questions? Please line up at the microphones. Yeah, someone's getting there. Yeah. All right, so two questions. Uh, first, can you hear me? I can so, hear you. Good. Uh, second, now let's go with our controls. So these are kind of a custom case in which you... I, I missed a piece there, though, I'm sorry. It's, I do, uh, all right, so, so most of the time we're talking about, well, all kinds of different system calls and things, but what about our controls, which in general have a identification code and then all kinds of custom arguments inside them, usually a structure too. And what if we have a, we're trying to debug something which is communicated with a custom kernel mode component, say a custom driver, and therefore has an even more custom layout, so to say, so we don't know the exact layout yet. Can we specify something along the lines of, in this I control code, this, uh, this offset there should be an event handle or something like that, and then we can we trace that as well, et cetera, et cetera. So you're talking about a custom kernel with some added system calls? Not exactly, but IO controls by definition can be, well... Oh, oh sorry, I, I, now, I, IO now I've got the word, yeah. IOCTLs. Okay, um, so you've added some IOCTLs, potentially, is what you mean. Uh, I haven't, but say that you but want to reverse engineer you something, and yeah. you want to know exactly what's being sent underneath, etc. Can you somehow automate the process when you know the structure to an extent? Um, so... In the hypothetical case where you've added an IOCTL with perhaps its own associated structures, S-Trace isn't going to know about this. It'll display to you some numeric values, um, at least that's what I assume will happen. You know, for all this... Oh. Um, for, all the IO, for all the standard operations that IOCTL has, S-Trace will display those symbolically and it will display the corresponding arguments. But if you're talking about custom IOCTLs, then you're going to see a much more limited set of information unless you go and patch strace as well. Okay, so there's no way to, say, provide a file saying for this specific uh, IOCTO or whatever number just to display these in this format, etc. There's no way to extend it without patching the source, so to say. One way or other, there has to be some patching of the source. Now, just how simple that is for IOCTL operations, I'm not sure offhand. That's what I can't answer. Okay, thanks. Okay, no, I'll can repeat the question. To, uh, can you please go to the microphone? It will be easier. Uh, yeah, but uh, the stream has to see it. It's better for you if you can go to the microphone. It's your chance to be famous. <laughs> 
So the question was, um, there are some options for getting time and timestamps for system calls. Is there a way to graph that? Um, not that I'm aware of with S-Trace, but there are other tools that you might use to, to do that, things like Perf. Yeah, yeah. S-Trace is a much, more, a much simpler tool in some ways. Other questions? Thank you. Okay.